Я даю добровольное согласие на то, чтобы сняли видео со мной. Я Калашников Евгений Легович, рожден 2000 года, 16 марта. I give my voluntary consent to be filmed. I am Kalashnikov Evgeny Olegovich. I was born on the 16th of March 2000 in Novoazovsk, Donetsk region, where I lived when on February 24th Putin decided to start this so-called special operation. Before that, I had a neutral attitude toward Ukraine as well as Russia. After that, Russia died for me. I made a group with like-minded people, funeral for for our future. The sentiments there were extremely pessimistic. That is, we saw Ukraine being invaded by Eastern barbarians. I could not contact my godmother, who was in Mariupol. My grandmother died there. And no one knows what was happening to my father there then. I was just watching the Russian army destroy and taking over Ukraine. For eight months I was hiding, and then in the summer I realized that I had to do something. I had already seen that Ukraine had held out. Kyiv was defended, we fought back. It became clear to me that Ukraine will hold out, and it was necessary to do something. I got a job, worked in sales, earned money, around 50,000 rubles. At that time that was almost $1,000. Bought a laptop in order to live later and earn money remotely to edit video and do other things. But by my stupidity, in mid-November I went to shoot a strategic bridge. At that time the Crimean bridge was blown up and all the traffic was going through Novoazovsk. There were these anti-tanks obstacles which I used on the front line, water, construction material to Mariupol, which were carried across our bridge. And there were very terrible traffic jams. According to that, the bridge was fortified, there were dugout strange soldiers were sitting there. I think even anti-aircraft guns. So I decided to discreetly film this bridge to post it to this group that we had created. The military caught me, handed me over to the FSB and the FSB worked with me. Accordingly, they kept me for 24 hours and questioned me, beat me up a little, made me kneel down and asked about work with the Secret Service of Ukraine. Why was the bridge photographed? Who belonged to the group? They asked in detail who these people were, what these people did, who was the founder of this group. Well, once they checked everything out, they realized that this was just a man who made a stupid decision, went and made a stupid video and got caught. They realized they could easily send this person to war, and I was inclined to be forcibly mobilized. That is, they gave me a choice between 10 years in jail or going to war. I never considered the option of going to war with Ukraine. I was never going to do that. I originally thought if I went to war, I would always have the option of surrendering. I always considered it. I always had a white t-shirt on me to surrender or somehow to be discharged. Or according to Putin's law, at that time it was possible to be discharged as I was a student at that time. I could have been discharged or I could have used corruption to somehow get out of this situation. They made me shoot a video and put it on Rudenko telegram channel, where I said that I was a victim of Ukrainian propaganda, that I wanted to atone for my sins and join the valiant army of the DPR to defend my homeland. Having listened to Ukrainian propaganda, I mocked the armed forces and authorities of the DPR and Russia in general. I planned to post photos and videos of military equipment movements on the internet. I realized my misbehavior and I am terribly ashamed. Please forgive me. To atone for my guilt, I am going to the military enlistment office to go as a volunteer to defend our homeland. They gave me a grenade after that, fingerprinted me and told me that as soon as you do something wrong, they will plant a grenade in my house and I will go under a completely different article. For three months I was observing some blind belief in Ukraine being full of fascists, the Banderas, that the Russians will for sure win. They have a blind faith that they are right, that they are really liberating someone, that they are protecting someone, that is they are not over 
overwhelmed by the fact that they are destroying cities completely. People die. No, it's still believed to be liberation for them. I personally heard that the commander gave the order not to take any prisoners. I saw how, in fact, my own fellow soldiers who were caught for drinking were beaten up, cast in the pit. But once they caught three drug addicts and accordingly they were spun on a topic, the TA-57 handset, it's such a thing like a telephone for comms specialists. There is a cable, you spin it, the phone rings, you pick it up and communicate. And one of these phone wires is connected to the penis, the second wire to the leg. They start spinning it, it gives 128 volts, and you can hear just scary screams. At the same time, they shot that guy with a traumatic gun and hit him with a truncheon. All three of this stage of so-called pleasure were all happening at the same time. The commander gave an order not to take prisoners at all. And why did he say this? Because they took prisoners at that time and he was really surprised why they were taken. Because they were supposed to be shot. So at that time I was in the service sitting with the senior officer playing chess and I heard two Ukrainian prisoners being tortured on the third floor. They were tortured with the TA-57 handset. I don't know exactly what happened to them but this is probably what happened to my fellow soldiers. The same thing happened to them. As far as I know, they were taken by the FSB officers, these two prisoners, and they seem to be alive. Well, I don't know, I saw a video, I am video editor, so my task was to edit videos and there was a video shot with GoPro. And I saw how they actually took three prisoners. It seemed to go well at first, the way they were taking them was kind of civilized, but when the DPR army started suffering casualties, they were 200 and 300 cargoes. You couldn't see that on the video, but I asked what was done to them, to the prisoners, and they said they were shot, because there was no one to watch them anymore. Could you tell me about executions? As I understand, for the commanders... It was even a thing. When I was in the training camp, our platoon leaders, we called him Gena at that time as we were still in training, said not to take prisoners in any case, just to shoot them. They do not deserve to be taken prisoners, because they are animals, beasts, fascists, Nazis. He showed me a video with a Ukrainian soldier lying there and he said that he took his t-shirt off him. I saw a volunteer from Russia, his a drug addict. He was in jail for six years for drugs. The man is uneducated, stupid. They showed him a video of Ukrainian soldiers and he was enjoying it so much that he was seeing them killed. To be honest, at that time I saw this fascism and Nazism in person. That is more of Nazism because there really exists some kind of incomprehensible hatred towards Ukrainians, a desire to kill a hohol. There was a volunteer from Volgograd who came and he said that he came ideologically to kill the Ukrainians because he was tired of watching children die in Donbass. Uh, at the same time, he couldn't care less about the fact that in our Donetsk, where I lived, I often heard launches and shells. If this were Ukraine, I would not have heard the launches. And people started saying that the DPR themselves were shooting at Donetsk. Once they fired Donetsk with petal mines, which are banned by the Geneva Convention and obviously blamed Ukraine for that. The whole city was covered with petal mines. I am a person who has access to the internet and I can google information and I know that these mines are prohibited under the Geneva Convention and there are no such mines in Ukraine and one of the western countries could not supply these mines. Accordingly, the only thing left is that only Russia could have completely covered its own city with mines, the city with the civilian population. What else can you be surprised about if this fascist state does not spare its own people? What can you say about those who are considered enemies to them when they shell them with rockets and wipe cities to powder
Well, I mean, I've seen a lot of videos of Ukrainian prisoners getting their balls cut off and their Adam's apples torn out there. And of the recent ones, when I became a prisoner of war, they showed how the head of the Ukrainian soldier was cut off. To compare, I was captured by the armed forces of Ukraine. It's just day and night. When I was in the Russian army, I constantly heard different stories about why we should shoot the armed forces of Ukraine prisoners of war. That is because they don't feel sorry for our prisoners, that the armed forces of Ukraine soldiers form their mouths, noses, asses, of course, they cut off their balls. That's a long-standing theme. They say there are a lot of drugs in every single position they take. They immediately find some kind of warehouse with an unimaginable amount of drugs. And the tanks in the Ukrainian army have the welded bottom, so the tankers do not come out later. I mean, there are a lot of silly stories like that, and this excuses why it took so long, why they did not take Ukraine in three or five days. But they have been fighting for a whole year because Ukraine has been supplied with weapons and the dugouts have been dug for eight years. That is, they list very silly excuses for their defeat, but nevertheless, the blind faith that they will win is simply unshakable. I see a really fanatical desire to send their people to true death, because it is obvious that they lost the war. All their regular army has been killed near Kyiv, all of them have been put there down. The command does not know how to properly manage their soldiers, but the only thing they can do is just to throw waves of meat. And why should they prepare the meat, train them normally, give them normal equipment, if no matter how good or bad a fighter is? Because of a bad command, he will go and just die. That is why everybody was trained as fast as possible, they were given squalid uniforms and rusty submachine guns and sent to the slaughter. Those who were, like me, more valuable, educated people, they could become UAV operators. That's what they actually wanted to make of me. If people served in prison are uneducated, they were used as cannon fodder, they do not have any other variants. I can't explain it in a normal way. In other words, the Geneva Conventions do not work in Russia at all. I was surrounded by people in general educated, knowledgeable, understanding, and I had access to the internet, and in general we had Ukrainian television until 2019. I mean in Novozovsk because I was in Donetsk, but my mother was there, her antenna was turned to Mariupol, and she could watch Ukrainian news without any problems. And then, somewhere in 2019, they put a tower next to us, about a kilometer away from our house and then all Ukrainian television and Ukrainian communications completely disappeared. There was only Russian news, so at least my mother started being brainwashed only in 2019. Although they did not manage to brainwash her completely, she also had such glorification of Putin, but she also had hatred for Russia when she saw how our people were being sent for slaughter. And when the bodies were brought in, she was very angry at the prospect of me being sent to the slaughter in the same way. And I had access to the internet and I had an understanding that, well, that's the way it is. Так оно есть. Как есть. Слухай, а что робити тим so what should people who stayed there do? I mean the younger generation, maybe older people as well. For those who don't want to be mobilized by Russians, what should they do? The situation is quite difficult for young people, because even to leave the DPR you have to pay about 120,000 rubles. I actually saved that money so that I could pass the checkpoint and not be mobilized. It's a very difficult situation, that is hiding, trying to leave. But frankly speaking, I don't know how to leave Russia, because now the borders are closed there. So I don't know how to leave it. It's really a difficult situation for young people, if you were already taken away, if you were mobilized then you only have to surrender. There is such a program, I want to leave. I wanted to use it, but it didn't work out. I couldn't get through at the time, and I communicated through a chatbot, but it didn't work for me through that program. When I surrendered, they had already taken away my phones, sent me to the slaughter, because they realized that I wouldn't operate drones and they wouldn't take any advantage of me. They knew I have pro-Ukrainian views, they found the 
correspondence, so they just decided to get rid of me. They took away my phone, wanted to take away all my documents. My Ukrainian passport was taken away a long time ago. I still had my DPR passport, my military ID and my medical card. I had to assault in the first row. If you already have such a sad situation as I had, then you only have to take the risk, assess the situation and roughly estimate how you could escape. How exactly did I escape? Actually, when we were already brought to the front, we walked for two days to the edge of the line. On the last day I found out that I was sent to the slaughter. I was told, you are punished, you go in the assault. So the task was given to me and another one who had also messed up. He got drunk and was also sent to the assault first. We had to dig two additional dugouts. That is, there were already four dugouts and we had to dig more, so that 20 people would come in the evening for them to be able to assault the AFU positions next morning. All day long, while we were digging the dugouts, a Ukrainian bird flew in. A UAV and mortar fire began immediately. And I decided to take advantage of these moments, because when the mortar fire started, everyone suddenly started hiding. I assessed the situation from which side I could get shot while I was hiding, because there was another unit. I asked these guys where our guys were, where the military doctors were so as not to get killed from the cliff, where the snipers were, where they were sitting, where the AFU position was. Well, that is about how I figured out my escaping road. At four p.m. I prepared my white t-shirt, which I always had with me from the start, threw away the submachine gun, took my medical documents, I had all sorts of documents prepared. I had my flag jacket and helmet with me. I was digging a dugout when a bird flew in, so everyone started hiding. I immediately hid under a tree during the mortar fire. And at that moment I started running. Actually, I ran across the field about two to three hundred meters. And you were putting on your white t-shirt at that moment? No, no, the shirt had already been taken off of me. I was just running, waving the t-shirt, my hands were up, and I was running, of course, unarmed. There was a big ravine there, but I didn't see it. I was surprised that it was there and it was five meters deep. So I had to jump into it and somehow get out through the bushes. In the end, I climbed out into the woods, but it was on a hill, so there was the threat to be shot from the same cliff or a sniper, it still remained. Well, fortunately I was covered by the trees. I was walking about 500 meters at a fast pace. I just couldn't run anymore. I was very tired at that moment. All the time while I was walking to the AFU positions my arms were raised. All the time I was waving my t-shirt and all the time I was shouting I surrender, don't shoot please. In the end I found the Ukrainian armed forces positions. Surprisingly, I saw the armed forces of Ukraine soldiers first before they saw me. I stood up straight away with my hands in the air and said, I surrender, don't shoot. A soldier turned his gun on me, asked where I was from, how many of us were there, one or more, and said, come here. I was interrogated and fully stripped for them to understand whether I had a weapon or not. But I was not beaten, I was given water and calmly questioned. Но мне никто не бил, мне дали воды, спокойно опросили. 